chairperson for the evening, uh, Dr. Surekha uh, Rajadaksha, ma'am. She, she is, so, so possibly everybody who's attending this has been directly or indirectly been taught by her. Can we go to the previous slides, Neha? Yeah. So, ma'am is currently with uh, Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and Bharti Vidya Peet, but she has been instrumental with the neurology setup and the epilepsy unit at uh, Wadia Hospital in Mumbai. She has been to Mass General and to New York University for uh, her epilepsy training, and she has numerous publications and book chapters. Uh, Ma'am, we are honored to have you over here, and the stage is yours. Hello, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are very uh, happy to have Dr. Lakshmi Naren here with us. He is a consultant epileptologist, pediatric neurologist at Glen Eagles Global Health City at Chennai. And he's a very experienced and an eminent uh, epileptologist and pediatric neurologist. He's been trained in Ames All India Institute, Royal Children's Hospital, Melbourne. He's been faculty with Asian Epilepsy Academy, EG and Epilepsy course. He's a member of the ILAE Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Task Force. He's a convener for Young Epilepsy Section of the Indian Epilepsy Society. And uh, he, he has a whole lot of credits to his name. He has many pub publications. And he's trained extensively and he works probably exclusively in pediatric epilepsy and drug-resistant epilepsy cases. And here he will share with us his experience and what he has done in his career at uh, Chennai. Over to you, Lakshmi Naren. Very happy to have you on board. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, very good evening, everyone. Um, Long time since I've done one uh, webinar after uh, attending in-person conferences, it uh, uh, looks a bit uh, different. Okay, let me share the slides. Just give me a second. Can you see the slides? Perfect. Thank you. So basically what we thought uh, when um, uh, Kaushik and Vishal discussed about this talk. I thought uh, uh, one of the uh, few topics that have not been covered that much in uh, this particular forum, especially AOCN uh, platform, is uh, pediatric epilepsy pre-surgical workup. So that's uh, nowadays becoming uh, uh, very much part of a curriculum for uh, pediatric neurologists. So in the next uh, 45 minutes, we will talk about how do we go about epilepsy pre-surgical evaluation. So this is basically meant to be a, a basic uh, uh, a session, though I will cover a little bit advanced topics as well. So if there is any queries, because this is a vast topic, uh, with a given time, I'll be uh, covering uh, overview. So if you have any questions in any particular uh, specific aspects, you can ask me and we can discuss at the end. So we'll be talking about why epilepsy surgery is needed and whom to evaluate and when and where to evaluate steps of pre-surgical evaluation, decision-making tree, and uh, there are many pitfalls in each of these steps that we follow, and then I'll summarize. So we all know this uh, particular slide. We have seen uh, this many times over the uh, years. So this is a landmark Quan uh, uh, and uh, Brody study that showed after failure of two anti-seizure medications, the chance of long-term complete seizure freedom and uh, seizure remission is uh, very less. And uh, th though this study has been uh, done uh, two, three decades ago, their follow-up studies again showed this figure of 30% of patients remaining drug resistant despite different medication, different strategies has not changed over the decades. Their recent publication again showed this 30% figure has not changed even after introduction of many newer medication since their first study. So nearly one third of our patients are drug resistant. So why we are so much interested in drug resistant epilepsy? Because not only this is very prevalent in pediatric age group, 
and they can uh, cause a lot of morbidity and increased mortality and but also the neurocognitive and neuropsychological profile of these patients are much uh, uh, much to be desired compared to their age related uh, peers and uh, the overall quality of life for the patients and the families are poor again compared to the peers not only increase morbidity and mortality there is a high socio economic burden for these patients and families in these patients the only thing that matters for them is the seizure freedom because that can reverse many of these factors so it's not only persistent seizures that uh, the uh, children with the drug resistant epilepsy go through there are a lot of other problems many medications cost of medications adverse effects due to the higher dosage of, of medication that they are on cognitive problems educational vocational opportunities being denied due to multiple seizures and many children we know they don't even attend school because of multiple daily drop attacks and injurious problematic disabling seizures and uh, you would have come across many different data regarding drug resistant epilepsy and how it increases morbidity and mortality um this particular data is very stock i'll show you why that is this is a retrospective study done in canada nearly uh, more than 23000 adults but the same data can be easily extrapolated to pediatric population as well what they basically did they can age controlled the uh, factors baseline factors and then they looked at what is their uh, premature mortality rate standardized mortality rate for this entire cohort the premature mortality rate is 7.2 percentage for drug resistant epilepsy that is much 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 more than uh, usually 1 percentage or less than 1 percentage for general population the more stark data is if you compare these cohort into three different categories where did they receive care for their drug resistant epilepsy mind you these are not just epilepsy uh, well controlled on medication these are all drug resistant epilepsy so when they looked at the three different levels of care in canada uh, non specialist care by general practitioners the specialist care by the neurologists and the third level of care in comprehensive epilepsy program the data is very stark you can see that 9.4 percentage mortality rate for those managed by non specialists almost drops down to half 5.6 percentage by neurologists further half 2.8 percentage that is one fourth of the original figure that is when they are managed by comprehensive epilepsy programs so the drug resistant epilepsy patients are better cared for in specialized unique comprehensive epilepsy programs because they understand the biology better they understand the disease better they understand multiple comorbidities and other uh, disease modifying factors better so this is a kind of precision medicine that we are talking about at this time not only precision medicine means you need to have a gene uh, genotype and you need to target your molecule to, towards the genotype not only that you individualize your treatment approaches which anti epileptic medication to choose for which patient that also is a kind of precision medicine so that's what is responsible for nearly almost three fourth reduction in mortality when they are cared for at comprehensive epilepsy program rather than by non specialists at the community so this is very 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 stark data very important so this gives a message by itself so the learning points here is we need to refer the patients early to the specialist care whenever we come across drug resistant epilepsy at least get a opinion by comprehensive epilepsy centers once because you can clarify the uh, the epilepsy syndrome clarify the uh, precise phenotype according to that you can have your precise individualized treatment plan whether they are surgical candidates or not whether they are going to be cured by surgery or not entirely depends on this one step of early referral and getting opinion by comprehensive epilepsy center so early referral for drug resistant epilepsy is very 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 important i cannot over emphasize this here moving forward there is a huge treatment gap there is a referral gap and there is a treatment gap so this is a data again by from western world this is from europe so you can imagine how much will be the referral gap and treatment gap for india so by all these platforms and discussions and uh, educations and continued uh, medical education programs we are trying to bridge this referral gap and the treatment gap so why epilepsy surgery 
I'll give you a case example and I'll try to elucidate this point why we need epilepsy surgery for drug resistant epilepsy patients. This girl, uh, about 16 year old when she presented to us, she was in 12th standard, had a normal perinatal development and intellectually normal child, had mild uh, learning problems, habitual seizures since three years of age, single stereotyped brief seizures, but multiple daily since the onset. She has ha hasn't had uh, more than a month of seizure freedom with uh, so many medications. And uh, she used to have some aura of vibration sense in the right arm, brief stiffening of both arms right more than the left. I'll show you the seizure. So most of these seizures were out of sleep. So you can see the right hand is stiff, flaying. Left hand also is stiff, but she looks up to the right side. That's all. The seizure lasted for just 20 seconds. But this was so much disabling because seven, eight seizures like this every night, disturbing her sleep, disturbing the family. So this was very disabling for the family. And this is the MRI. Most of you would uh, already point out that there is a lesion there. So there is a bottom of the sulcus dysplasia in the left middle frontal gyrus region where the arrow is pointed, right? So this particular lesion was known from the first MRI at three years of age for this particular child. But because it was a left hemisphere, because it is just adjacent to the Broca's area, no one was willing to operate on this particular lesion. So she was on multiple medication. She was going on with the seizures multiple daily for more than 13 years with multiple medications, associated cognitive problems and learning difficulties. So this was further evaluation when we did our MRI. So again, the same thing. So extent of lesion, we wanted to be sure whether it's only that, not anywhere else. So this is a focal epilepsy, left hemispheric focus, left frontal seizure focus, and type two FCD, that is bottom of sulcus dysplasia. The main problem was close to Broca's area. So you have a lesion, very precise, small lesion, but your lesion is very much related to uh, eloquent cortex. So if you are not careful enough to remove that, then she can have a significant speech difficulty. That was the complexity in this patient. That is why though she presented to multiple different uh, apex um, uh, epilepsy surgery centers, uh, because of the risk involved, many centers refused surgery over the years. This is language fMRI. Again, you can show the bold signals very much on top of that sulcus. So this is the Broca's area signal, bold signal on the left middle frontal uh, gyrus. And uh, this is the sulcus leading on to that uh, bottom of sulcus dysplasia. So it is very much, very closely related to the Broca's area and the language network. So you can imagine why the patients uh, was refused surgery in multiple centers. I'll just cut the show story short. This is not such, such straightforward. We did evaluate her with the studio EEG to, to language mapping as well as to know the extent of the resection that we need to plan and the relation between the ictal, the seizure arising zone as well as the eloquent cortex. So she underwent a studio EEG. Finally, she landed on the table and luckily for her, we could do a limited, very small focal resection under awake craniotomy. She was awake and the language mapping was done. And uh, this was done in 2016, nearly uh, to the date uh, uh, six years ago. And uh, this is the end of the surgery. You can see a very small focal resection of that uh, bottom of sulcus dysplasia. All these D and S and D, these were the language areas. Basically, this is the pars triangularis, this is pars opercularis, and this is the sylvian fissure. This is the superior temporal gyrus, your Wernicke area, where the speech arrest was there. And these were, again, showing speech uh, problems when we stimulated on the table. And uh, for time, I'm not showing the awake craniotomy and uh, testing during the surgery, just during the resection and just immediately after the resection. But uh, she developed speech arrest at uh, nearly towards the end of the resection. So we just stopped the resection there. Luckily, by that time, the whole lesion was out. So this is a post-operative MRI. You can see 
post-operative MRI, you can see that uh, the lesion is completely out and uh, the resection is very small. So this is your Broca's area and uh, just behind the Broca's area, our resection uh, line is uh, there. The histopathology confirmed that this is FCD type 2B with balloon cell dysplasia and uh, very fortunate for her, completely seizure-free angel class 1A outcome for six years now. And preoperatively, she had multiple daily seizures. Despite all these precautions, she had transient dysphasia and speech apraxia for nearly two, three months postoperatively. But uh, again, she made a complete recovery. She has now completed uh, college. She's doing excellently well. And uh, she came off medication one year after the surgery was over. So she is completely seizure free, medication free, no deficits, though there was a transient deficit of uh, speech uh, naming problem and uh, uh, dysphasia and dyspraxia that is also completely recovered. So this is a success story. Why this need to be highlighted? She started this at three years of age. This operation could have been done at three and a half, four, five years of age. Once we are, we are sure this kind of lesion is not going to be completely seizure free with medications alone for long term. There can be honeymoon period of one to three, maximum up to five years of seizure freedom with some medication, especially sodium, channel blockers for uh, FCD, focal cortical dysplasia, but long-term seizure outcome will be invariably, they will go into a resistant phase and multiple daily seizures or disabling seizures very frequent. So this operation could have been done early on in her life. And I'm sure that would have made much better quality of life for her for so many years. She wouldn't have lost her childhood to the medications, hospitalizations and the seizures. So this is what epilepsy surgery can do. So the medications on one side, 13 years, no seizure freedom, surgery, and completely seizure free for six years. So this is a very uh, contrasting uh, data. So we need to be very mindful. Epilepsy surgery is the treatment of choice for those patients who can be cured by epilepsy surgery. We know epilepsy is a progressive disease during, due to kindling and uh, secondary epileptogenesis, which can form new foci of uh, uh, another uh, independent seizure foci, and there can be uh, aberrant networks forming and network damaging the cognitive memory and other vital functions. So many people think epilepsy surgery is a last resort option. Once you have exhausted all the medication, all the treatment options, that is a misconception even many uh, neurologists and pediatric neurologists hold. So basically we would like to highlight that epilepsy surgery is not the last resort option. For these kind of patients who failed two medications, early epilepsy surgery is curative and that can make a hell lot of difference for the family and the patients. So the learning point here today is epilepsy surgery is curative. There is a misconception that uh, many people think, including many pediatric neurologists, that epilepsy surgery is a palliative surgery, palliative option. I'll go to the uh, kinds of surgery that we have at the end of this session. But uh, at this point, it is good to remember epilepsy surgery in most cases, kind of these uh, focal resections and focal lesional cases, it is completely curative, not palliative. I again reiterate the point why epilepsy surgery with this data. This is again, uh, they did a retrospective analysis of these patients, uh, nearly 900 patients who underwent resections, multiple different uh, uh, types of epilepsy surgeries over years and those 100 patients who never underwent epilepsy surgery. So these are the two comparative arms. 900 patients who underwent surgery, 100 patients who never underwent epilepsy surgery. If you see the uh, death rate, mortality rate, deaths per thousand person years, for the patients who underwent surgery, it is 8.6 per thousand person years with a range of 6.5 to 11. If you compare that to non-surgical group, the death rate is almost triple, 25 versus eight, with a range of 14 to 41, nearly up to five times the uh, range of mortal rate for the resected patient. So again, what it means for drug resistant epilepsy, if you are cared for in comprehensive epilepsy program, you were death rate, mortal rate is much less to the tune of 75% less. Second, if 
uh, the patients with the drug resistant epilepsy, if they undergo resective surgery, their mortality rate is much, much less compared to those patients who do not undergo surgery. So this is a very stark data. It's undeniable. So this is the standard of care that we would like. So for those patients that can undergo epilepsy surgery, for those patients that are amenable for epilepsy surgery, epilepsy surgery is the way to go. Another set of data in the subgroup analysis in the same data set, if you see, those patients who underwent surgery, nearly 550 patients were having seizure recurrence, two thirds, and one third were having seizure free outcome. If you compare the mortality rate between them, those who were seizure free, the mortality rate was much, much less, almost half when you had underwent surgery, but did not become completely seizure free. So basically this means the seizure freedom is the single most important determinant of reducing morbidity and mortality in drug resistant epilepsy patients. So epilepsy surgery is basically a way of making the patient seizure free. Okay, moving on. There is this concept of some epilepsy syndromes are very highly amenable for cure by epilepsy surgery. And in these kind of patients, epilepsy surgery is the treatment of choice rather than just going through uh, medications. Even for the epilepsy surgically amenable patients, diet therapy, ketogenic diet, even that doesn't uh, give you that kind of a seizure freedom. This is again a research data over many years. For Surgically amenable patients, ketogenic diet and the other dietary therapies are less optimal compared to epilepsy surgery. Then, where is the problem? If it is so black and white, why still we are talking about epilepsy surgery in reference? Because it should automatically happen. So the real world is, real world is not that simple. So there are many reasons why uh, even including epileptologists may not refer, refer patients for epilepsy surgery. So this is again a study done in Italy. And this showed there are many factors why a neurologists, including, including epilepsy trained neurologists may not refer the patient for epilepsy surgery. Single most important is they feel the seizure frequency that the patient has is much lower compared to what they think should be the seizure frequency for epilepsy surgery. And again, for this point, as I told you, seizure freedom is the only determinant that will reduce all your mobility and mortality, not just the seizure control, not just the reduced seizure frequency. Okay, And there are many other um, uh, perceived factors, including low seizure severity, psychiatric comorbidity, and uh, neurological deficits were there, and they thought it is a bit expensive. This is the physician side. This is the neurologist, epileptologist side, why they were not referring early. The same study showed why patients were refusing referral to epilepsy surgery centers. They thought there's an overall fear about a, a, a brain surgery in common and uh, many reasons. And there is a physical handicap. Assumed, there is no assumed success of surgery. And again, patients felt the seizures are not severe enough to undergo surgery. And uh, again, the patients felt the same, the seizure frequency is not good enough to undergo surgery. And they thought there will be a miracle drug coming up in the over the years that will cure them no need for surgery. So this is the Western world, developed world. You can imagine multiple other factors, um, again, playing in the minds of the doctors and the patients for late referrals or non-referrals in India. So when do we do epilepsy surgery? Not for all the patients. So we have a very select group of patients within the drug-resistant epilepsy where we go for epilepsy surgery. So children with drug-resistant epilepsy that has a lesion present in a region that can be safely resected without causing disabling deficits, and the lesion can be needing removal on its own if it is a vascular lesion like a recurrent bleeding into cavernoma or it is a tumor that needs resection on its own irrespective of the epilepsy. And finally, patient or family needs to be fully informed of the advantages and risks of the epilepsy surgery and they need to give informed consent. So these are the indications for epilepsy surgery. And most importantly, epilepsy surgery is not contraindicated because there are many misconceptions. 
say for example some neurologists think some epileptologists think seizure semiology suggests you of involvement of primary eloquent cortex that may not be amenable for surgery that is one of the common misconception neurological deficits on examination again people think it may not be amenable for surgery because the patient has already deficits so deficit might worsen or new deficits may might accrue bilateral intraictal epilepsy activity on eeg diffuse or generalized ictal onset in scalp eeg normal mri multiple diffuse lesions on mri or certain genetic mutations all these are not contraindication basically what we are saying epilepsy surgery is still possible even if the semiology suggests prim primary eloquent cortex even if these there are some deficits on the examination even if the eeg shows bilateral intraictal epileptic from activity or generalized to ictal onset even if the mri is normal you can still evaluate the patient because there are other tests that might point to a, a suspected lesion or a lesion where you can localize and still reset and make the patient completely seizure free multiple diffuse lesions again not all the lesions cause uh, seizures and epilepsy only one of those lesions might be responsible for the patient's uh, disabling seizure that if you are able to identify that particular lesion you can still remove that lesion and make the patient seizure free single most important example for multiple lesions still amenable for epilepsy surgery is tuberous sclerosis you all know uh, the tuberous sclerosis epilepsy surgery is uh, uh, very closer to my heart so even after having Uh, many tubers bilaterally still we can localize one particular tuber that can cause the cause of the epilepsy and we can remove that particular tuber and the patient can be completely seizure free as like fcd so in a way biologically tubers are like fcd so instead of having one fcd what i showed you in that uh, patient uh, one particular focal cortical dysplasia and the left uh, middle frontal gyrus you have multiple fcds that is tuberous sclerosis for you there are many uh, uh, similarities including genetic uh, morphological histopathological uh, similarities between fcd type 2b balloon cell type dysplasia and tubers so we think biologically these are very related entity certain genetic mutations including this uh, very notorious depdc5 mutation so if you find this mutation in your patient with the focal epilepsy you can be pretty sure there is a underlying focal cortical dysplasia somewhere sitting and that is the cause for this patient's epilepsy so this particular mutation depdc5 and the nprl3 that's all are related mtor pathway gator pathway so these lesions signify most likely there is underlying fcd focal cortical dysplasia in the patient even if it is mri negative mri occult you have to keep looking for that particular small lesion if you remove that lesion the patient can be completely seizure free so all these listed out here are not contraindication for epilepsy surgery then what are the contraindication we don't do epilepsy surgery for those patients who are well controlled on medications so pharmaco responsive epilepsy we should not do epilepsy surgery and other genetic causes like scn1a cdkl5 and glut1 deficiency these we know these are diffuse diseases so these are not amenable for surgery so these are contraindication whenever you find these uh, 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 genetic mutations that patients will not undergo epilepsy surgery we know progressive neurological diseases including neurometabolic neurodegenerative disorders are not uh, to be undergoing epilepsy surgery and permanent disabling neurological deficits are expected out of removing that particular region or lesion again that is a contraindication for epilepsy surgery so going going on to the concept of multiple different uh, uh, zones that we have so basically the pre surgical evaluation aims to localize the focus to determine the epileptogenic zone and to elucidate the relationship between epileptogenic zone and the eloquent area of the brain say for example in this particular example here in the cartoon what we have shown so there is this um, seizure onset zone that is shown in red and uh, even though the seizure onset zone is only a small bit there but you can have the intraictal epileptic discharges very diffusely that is depicted by the irritative zone and you can see this is just posterior to the 
post central gyrus so it, it is very much uh, in proximity to your eloquent cortex and uh, you can have other regions like the lesion can be a bit larger than the seizure onset zone so you need to basically work out what is the ictal onset or seizure onset zone and uh, what is the lesional zone and what is the epileptogenic zone so these are the three most important zones that we will talk about basically the epileptogenic zone is a theoretical concept in this particular cartoon whatever we have shown in other words all these you can uh, quantify say for example ictal onset zone you can quantify symptomatogenic zone you can guess functional deficit zone you can see how much it is there in pet scan an irritative zone depending on the uh, eeg spikes whether it's a scalp eeg or invasive eeg so all these can be to some extent uh, uh, can be measured in terms of their magnitude and the extent of the region in the brain but the epileptogenic zone is a little bit of theoretical construct it is very difficult for you to exactly quantify and exactly localize so basically this is a minimum amount of cortex or cortical region that must be resected or inactivated or disconnected to give you seizure freedom for that particular patient so epileptogenic zone is a minimum amount of cerebral cortex that needs to be resected or disconnected to make the patient seizure free okay so all these other measurable zones are not directly equivalent to uh, the epileptogenic zone and the interrelationship and concordance and the overlaying of these different zones can be very different in a given patient so next one or two slides i'll try to explain these concepts because this is a very 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 important concept for us to go forward to further evaluation of the patient so structural lesion is single most important determinant of prognosis in epilepsy surgery especially the lesions like focal cortical dysplasia the most important prognostic fact factor for complete seizure freedom long term is the completeness of the resection so the structural lesion which is measured by mri is the single most important factor in determining not only how much to resect or where to resect but also the long term seizure remission rates if you are able to resect the structural lesion completely then the long term resection rates are very high on the other hand if you leave a bit of focal cortical dysplasia especially the patient will have a seizure recurrence maybe one month later six months later or one or two years later so it can be early um, early failure or late failure depending on the how much epileptogenic networks that you have already disrupted by removing the structural lesion so the structural lesion is directly related to your mri so you can quantify that very much but sometimes it's not that straight forward the focal cortical dysplasia the the margins can be a bit fuzzy what you are seeing on the mri may be just the tip of the iceberg but the whole iceberg that is uh, in the depths may not be exactly visible on the mri so it may be a bit difficult and it's all the time uh, some parts of, or the other are left out because many of you who have gone to the operation theater to see the brain surgery it's unlike any other surgery like for example you were bowel or uh, uh, lungs or heart surgery you have a very clear landmarks in the surgical field but in the brain surgery you don't have that kind of a landmarks like this is the focal cortical dysplasia this is where it is um, uh, ending and this is where the normal cortex starts it is not that straight forward on the table on the surface of the uh, brain so it can be very uh, dicey at, at times so the irritative zone is basically the uh, zone where the intrinsic epileptic discharges are manifested so this this can be quantified again on the scalp level or in the intracranial level by invasive eeg then you have a hfo zone that is a new concept where you have a high frequency oscillations in the ecog whether it's a, a intraoperative ecog or uh, the long term studies invasive eeg so that again uh, have another layer for this and uh, the pet and spect usually they measure the uh, functional deficit zone and there is a ictal eeg and you can have a ictal eeg onset zone so these different zones are uh, overlay there is a lot of different overlay and concordance between these different zones i will go one by one in the investigation then we will decide how to 
go about this. There can be so much of overlap. This is an ideal case where you have the epileptogenic zone that is fully covering the epileptogenic lesion as well as symptomatogenic zone as well as ictal onset zone. Say for example, that FCD I showed you, the left frontal FCD, for that patient, the symptomatogenic zone was also very restricted and the lesion and the ictal onset zones were very uh, tightly together. Why I'm saying that? Because we evaluated her with uh, very detailed stereo EEG, intracranial EEG. So we could uh, see this kind of a tight relationship. So this is ideal patient and this is uh, less common. This is not the rule. Usually you have discordance between these different zones. So you can have a different uh, a degree of discordance that adds your complexity to the patient. So this is the comparison between what are the uh, zones that you need to resect to make the patient seizure free. Most, uh, most of the times, the epileptogenic zone can be mostly just structural lesion. Say, for example, you have a very focal, focal cortical dysplasia or a tuber. We just do lesionectomy. So that means the structural lesion is the epileptogenic zone for you in that particular patient, right? On the other hand, some other patient like FCD, focal cortical dysplasia type 1, where you don't even know the extent on the MRI. And uh, many times this can be just gradient from completely normal to uh, FCD 1C, 1B, 1A, all the different uh, combinations. So there you can measure the structural lesion and the ictal onset zone and your HFO zone. So this can be resected to make the patient seizure free. And in another case, even though HFO zone was a bit more widespread, you can just resect seizure onset zone and structural lesion to make the patient seizure free. So these are different uh, constructs and this vary from patient to patient. So this is highly individualized. Where is my a proprogenic zone for this particular patient. That is what these uh, imagined lines, imaginary lines show. For individual patient, you need to work that out. And that is the whole crux of the pre-surgical evaluation. How much I should resect? Only the lesion or lesion plus little bit of HFO zone or lesion plus little bit of seizure onset zone. So that is the uh, extent what we decide in the pre-surgical evaluation. And Till now, what we talked about, a structural lesion and a structural um, uh, region, anatomical region of resection. But epilepsy is not that simple in all the patients. So some patients, it may be just a network. So there are multiple different nodes of the network. Say, for example, a connected, highly connected regions like your hippocampus, amygdala, entorhinal cortex, parahippocampal gyrus, and limbic structures like your uh, insula, orbitofrontal cortex. All these are very richly connected network by uncinate uh, uh, fasciculus and other uh, white matter pathways. So if your uh, seizure starts, the, basically the network hypothesis says, like if they are highly connected regions, say for example, A, B, C, D, these uh, uh, imaginary examination uh, example here. So in this, any point the seizure starts, A, B, C, D, the seizure semiology will be exactly same and the scalp EEG can be exactly same because they are highly connected network and they, the interaction is bidirectional. The seizure starts at C, goes to A or seizure starts at A, goes to C. It will be same semiologically and uh, on scalp EEG level many times. So this is one of the caveat that we always have to deal with. You can't be uh, very categorical or dogmatic about, no, 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 this seizure starts only in A and then goes to B, C. For that, you need a very detailed intracranial evaluation. So this kind of construct and caveat in uh, analyzing the uh, ictal video EEG as well as scalp EEG is very, very important to note because this is single most important reason for why many patients fail. So what are the steps? So we have uh, most important initial steps to follow. Any patient that comes to us with drug resistant epilepsy, the single important question that I have in mind is whether all the seizures are same single type or the patient has multiple different seizure types. This is the single most important data that I need. 
So that can be only by detailed clinical history. Because even if there are three or four seizure types, you recorded only one seizure type in the video EEG. So video EEG will not give you this information. You can miss out all the three seizures because the patient was on medication, because that seizure was less frequent. So the video EEG will not give you the answer whether the patient has only single seizure type. That should come from detailed clinical evaluation of age at onset, seizure type, multiple seizure type, seizure semiology, phenomenology, and the clinical course and all the medication. So clinical data should be very thoroughly analyzed before we go on to the next step. The single most important next step will be the video EEG. Many times patients come to us with the outside MRI or CT scan. So at this point in time, we just keep that in mind, but our systematic analysis will be, we go through the patient very detailed clinically and we formulate a hypothesis. Okay, this particular patient has a single seizure type, focal epilepsy, could be left hemispheric, possibly left insulin. So this much we can deduct from the clinical data. If you are careful enough, if you are thorough enough. Then we go into the video EEG and we confirm what we thought in the clinical data analysis. So in the video EEG, we connect the patient and we record the uh, video EEG for two or three days or many times in patients with multiple daily seizure, it can be just a few hours that you can record uh, many seizures. So how many seizures to record? Again, it's a big question, but we would record at least four to six seizures depending on the clinical scenario. If it is very infrequent seizure, even two or three seizures enough, but pediatric epilepsy, mostly they have high seizure load and mostly they have multiple weekly seizures. So if you just reduce the medication a little bit, you can record multiple seizures. So it is very important. You cannot go with just one seizure because many times this happens you record one seizure, you record third, fourth, fifth seizure. The fifth seizure may be multiple, uh, slightly different from the first seizure. I'll give you an example. One patient was referred to us saying this is a left to temporal epilepsy. He's a 13 year old boy and multiple video EEG sessions have been already done. One in Delhi, one in another uh, Southern city. So the patient in both the places already video EEG showed left to temporal seizures. Okay, fine but the MRI is completely normal and uh, highly drug refractory. And he has a clusters. If you have clusters next to two, three days, he will not stand up. He will not walk. He'll go into completely encephalopathic phase vomiting. But in, in between the seizures, completely normal. So these clusters would happen every month. So what we did, we recorded another set of video EEG to clarify what is happening. The most important start point of this patient is the intractal EEG was encephalopathic during the cluster. That is the single most important. That told us it's unlikely that this is a single uh, structural substrate epilepsy from left to temporal. Because left temporal epilepsy usually wouldn't cause your uh, uh, encephalopathy background. It is not epileptic encephalopathy because we have gone through the previous video EEGs that was all very focal. So it is not epileptic encephalopathy for that matter. And the individual is completely normal in between the seizure clusters. So we recorded five seizures initially, all left temporal. To the extent some of my colleagues suggested, okay, we got five seizures, previous video EG, four seizures. Before that, some three or six seizures, all left to temporal. Okay, let us disconnect. This is left temporal epilepsy. Somehow I wasn't convinced looking at the background uh, activity that was highly encephalopathic for a left temporal epilepsy. So we, we discussed with the parents and told, let us continue one more day of video EEG. So we recorded another 24 hours of video EEG. He had four more seizures. All that four more seizures came from right temporal lobe. Right? So this can happen. And finally, that patient turned out to be a genetic epilepsy. So that explains everything. You were encephalopathic clusters, seizure, uh, highly refractory to medication. So sometimes the genetic epilepsy can behave like a single structural lesion epilepsy in the video age. So you need to be a little bit more careful. So that's why I'm saying there is no fixed number of seizures that you should be recording before you say this is enough. So it depends on individual circumstance, depends on the individual patient. Then we get the MRI done, depending on the video age data. Because this is the sequence order we go. 
we do clinical evaluation we do detailed video eeg then even if they have a, a mri unless otherwise it shows definite lesion most likely we would get another mri at this point in time it will be detailed sequence mri i'll tell you what are the detailed sequence that we do and this process is enough to have a complete picture of anatomical electro clinical anatomo electro clinical data anatomy by mri electro by eeg clinical by your clinical history and video eeg analysis of the semiology so this correlation of anatomo electro clinical is highly important and most of our patients who are straight forward for epilepsy surgery can undergo epilepsy surgery just with these kind of data they don't need any fancy uh, dense array eeg with the 256 uh, channels or meg or uh, mag magneto encephalography or spect or pet many patient don't need this okay so if you are careful in analyzing these three points completely thoroughly many patients can straight forward undergo surgery with clinical data video eeg data and mri neuropsychology is usually for adult patients and usually for temporal lobe surgery adult patients in pediatric patient the neuropsychology important is basically pre operative post operative comparison of developmental profile so basically this is a developmental assessment pre op and post op and this also mostly for documentation medical legal and academic purposes if you want to publish the data this is needed neuropsychology in adult patient is used for lateralization localization in case of temporal but uh, the importance of lateralization localization by neuropsychology in pediatric patient highly questionable so we don't do that much for that purpose so if uh, your data in the first phase that's why we call this non invasive phase 1 this is enough to uh, operate many patient if it is not enough then we go to non invasive phase 2 investigation in that the single most important investigation that we do is fdg pet pet scan of the brain so with four of these clinical data video eeg mri and pet remaining half of the patients many patients can undergo surgery so these are the common investigation that we do there are other investigation that is that are available source localization by magneto encephalography or high dense array eeg uh, electrical source localization this we don't do that much at all uh, personally speaking in my center we don't do uh, meg that commonly and esi we don't do at all and the spect we have capability we do do spect rarely but again not that commonly performed in our setup because clinical data video eeg mri and pet will be enough to have the patient uh, undergoing surgery in most of the cases nearly 80% of the cases will undergo surgery with these four data intraoperative electrocorticography we always do in all the patients that is fine tuning of the final resection and uh, especially in mri negative patients this is mandatory nowadays to do genetic testing whole exome sequencing to rule out the the genetic mutation that i have shown you and many other genetic mutation that are contraindications for epilepsy surgery and i gave a very elucidating uh, illuminating example of how a genetic epilepsy can behave like a single structural lesional epilepsy with a very cluster of seizure very focal from one hemisphere so even after all these non non invasive data if we have uh, in conclusion in conclusive data then we go for invasive eeg i'll deal with that slightly later so this is the process as i told you already we uh, have a very detailed clinical assessment including family history of uh, seizures and uh, a uh, detailed neuropsychological and neuro developmental behavioral assessment and video eeg mri so this is the basic phase one investigation and this is very 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 important so this is a systematic process and uh, we have to have a very good clinical formulation before we order any test and pre test probability of these highly important for this so we can have many tests but we need to know when to do what tests so coming to the first critical step video eeg which is always mandatory before surgery in pediatric patients if you see adult uh, literature they say if it is a straight forward uh, hippocampal sclerosis causing medial temporal lobe epilepsy many times you don't need ictal recording you don't need video eeg you can go with the mri clinical neuropsychological and eeg intraictal data alone that's a literature for you so basically that uh, ictal recordings did not make any difference in the final outcome 
that is again western data for our setup i would suggest for pediatric epilepsy it's always critical mandatory to have a, a documentation of what are the seizure types in the video eeg this is always always should be done this has a lot of implications not only for the precise uh, formulation of hypothesis but also medical legal bearing many times the patient will say this is not the seizure type the patient had before surgery and all that different uh, uh, complications you can have so better you always do this step systematically this is just an example of one patient showing a uh, very rhythmic periodic appearing uh, focal polyspike and spike wave discharges so these are pleomorphic the morphology of this is different from this different from this so there are shock waves there are spikes there are polyspikes there are polyspikes so these are appearing almost in a very rhythmic run so if you come across this kind of intractal epileptic discharges you can be pretty sure pretty certain that you are dealing with focal cortical dysplasia and the same patient showing very uh, burst of this fast activity with the polyspike slow wave discharges so this is this is our patient one of our patient with the right frontal focal cortical dysplasia and this is the paper showing scalp eeg biomarkers so you can have focal continuous fast spiking continuous irregular slowing what is called freds brushes and uh, uh, burst like epileptic activity what i showed you and polyspikes repetitive discharges all these are scalp biomarkers for focal cortical dysplasia so why i am emphasizing here so we analyze this intractal video eeg very detailed sometimes you can guess not only the lateralization and localization to the extent you can guess the etiology also and uh, once you analyze the intractal you go into the ictal data so carefully watch this ictal uh, video so she was sitting and playing the mobile and suddenly turned to the left where her uh, dad was sitting and uh, she is holding dad's hand with right hand and you will see what the left hand is doing so you can so you can see the left hand is extended and the uh, hand fingers are flayed so right hand is holding left hand is extended okay and uh, what is not obvious in this particular video is the first movement used, used to be always the head goes to the left the first movement used to be the eyes go to the left so with these pointers in the clinical semiological analysis you can lateralize and localize the seizure so right hand holding left hand Uh, extended and flayed so that is contralateral so left hand is extended contralateral so that is your right uh, hemisphere so the lateralization here is right hemisphere with a very early uh, eye deviation to the left that points to frontal eye field so the lesion or the seizure focus in this particular patient is likely to be near right frontal right frontal eye field so that is the lateralization localization this is how we analyze clinical semiology so this patient had some seven eight seizures overnight one in one night so you analyze this kind of seizures individually all the different seizures then you see how stereotypically they are or are there any variants variation in the uh, semiological features so this is just to highlight how we analyze clinical video eeg and this is another patient another girl she is sleeping the her seizures used to come from sleep so you can see she opened eyes she aroused from sleep she is bit confused sitting up retching and you can see right hand is bit postured dystonic before he she falls down and has a eye blinking left eye blinking left face sorry right eye blinking right face uh, contraction so basically she sat up had a vomiting and had a posturing of right hand 
then right eye blinking, right face jerking. So again, the posturing and the right face jerking. So this puts the lateralization on the left hemisphere and the prominent retching was the seizure for her and out of sleep. So this retching out of sleep and sometimes she visibly vomits also. So this ictal vomiting, retching out of sleep, this puts the seizure in the insula. So her seizure was from left to insula. So this patient has a very, this is a, though adult patient, this is a very uh, important seizure signs. So I just wanted to show you that. So he looks to the right side and starts chewing and there is a movement with the right hand. So right hand movements, rhythmic but non-clonic and uh, almost uh, his eyes are tracing the hand movements. So these are rhythmic non-clonic hand movements, what is called rinch. This is a very highly classical sign of uh, um, especially if you have the automatisms and the range, this localizes to the me mesial temporal region and the range is a contralateral feature. So right hand range, range that is a left. So this patient had a left MTLE, left mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. So this is how we analyze seizures and from just looking at the seizure itself, you can guess the lateralization localization. This is a very, 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 very important concept of pre-surgical evaluation. And this patient, again, the girl that I showed you before, and the seizure, I showed the same seizure. So the first movement is the right hand flaying and uh, some jerking of the right hand. And then she sits up, looks towards the right, and the left hand also stiff. So this is uh, basically means Right hand is the first movement and there was few jerking. So it's a left hemisphere. And again, eye deviation to the right that again possibly shows near the uh, frontal eye field and bilateral stiffening. Again, it is in the premotor region. So we know her lesion was in the left frontal, middle frontal virus. The purpose of showing this seizure again is basically to show the kind of EEG she had. This is the EEG just before seizure. You can see uh, the my, small amplitude spikes in the midline, FZ, CZ region, going into FC, F3, C3. This is a very localized spike discharges just before the seizure. This is not intractal. This is pre-ictal buildup, pre-ictal buildup. And then she had this very nice uh, spiking again, just before the seizure. And then she had a very low voltage beta fast activity. You can see only in the left and midline. So this is her seizure. So this, I wanted to highlight how we analyze the ictal EEG. So the pre-ictal buildup, very localized midline, left to front of central, and there is a very localized um, beta fast activity. Again, initially much more only in the left side, not much in the right, right side. So this again puts in the left hemisphere, left to front of central region. So I showed you how to analyze the interictal, ictal semiology video and ictal EEG. Then going to the neuroimaging. By this point, we would have a formulation. Okay, this patient has a left frontal focal epilepsy, possibly near uh, premotor region, possibly near frontal eye field. So that is the kind of information we have with the video EEG before we go on to see the neuroimaging. Okay. Even if the neuroimaging is normal, initially MRI normal, multiple times that happens, patients have series of MRI multiple times done over years and they are all reported normal and you get your MRI and finally find there is a lesion sitting there. That is obvious to you because you know this information where to look for. The radiologists don't know where to look for because you are the clinician, you know the seizure, you have formulated your clinical, electroclinical hypothesis where to look for, then you will find the lesion. So this is a very, very, very important step. Particle lesion is the one what we are looking at and uh, there are many incidental findings. Nowadays, the radiology reports are much to be desired and many times, uh, the moment you say patient has epilepsy, you will get a diagnosis uh, of a radiological uh, diagnosis of bilateral MTS. Don't be surprised. Many times there, are, there is no MTS there. Basically, the radiologist is trying to 
um, trying to impress upon you that uh, you have sent and I have given you the positive diagnosis. So beware of incidental findings. Beware of these false reporting. So you have to be very, very, very careful about the radiology. And when, especially when for medical treatment, it's okay. It doesn't matter that much. For when you go for surgery, you need to be really, really sure. And you need to look at the MRIs yourself. You have to be thoroughly looking at these and convinced before we propose the surgery. There are a lot of medical legal implications for these. So how to suspect the cases amenable for epilepsy surgery? The good starting point for the neurologist or pediatrician is neuroimaging. Neuroimaging is the key. So you look for these lesions, especially if they are unilateral. I told you bilateral lesions are not contraindication for surgery, but unilateral lesions are straightforward, laddu. So these kind of uh, porencephalixis and uh, bilateral occipital gliosis, very common in our situation. And the hemiatrophy, what you will see in Erasmus and encephalitis. And this is a very classical hippocampal sclerosis for you. And this is a glioma tumor. And these are different uh, cases of cortical dysplasia. This is focal cortical dysplasia, right frontal. And the same patient, what I showed you in the left frontal. And this is another patient with the left parietal, uh, what is called wine glass appearance of focal cortical dysplasia again. So, Focal cardiac dysplasia is one of the most important substrate for epilepsy surgery, even in our country, apart from gliosis. And this is a multiple uh, tubers of tuberous sclerosis. And even within the multiple tubers, you will see that epileptogenic tubers are uh, sometimes the largest one, and sometimes they have the uh, different appearance compared to other uh, tubers. And uh, some of the classical uh, findings that we have already described for MRI findings, then how to look for epileptogenic tubers and uh, the calcification again can point to epileptogenic tubers and this is a sturge weber syndrome and uh, with the posterior cortical atrophy and tram track appearance and this is subependymal uh, nodular heterotopia and this is a focal cortical dysplasia so coming to what is the mri protocol that you have to follow we have to take high resolution 3d t1 high resolution 3d flare and high in-plane resolution 2D coronal. These are the three most important sequences that are recommended. There is a harness protocol, again, which highlights these. This is very, very, very important. Just getting uh, any MRI, just plain MRI is not enough. You have to have a high resolution MRI. Because normal MRI many times means basically you are not able to pick up the lesion. And many times it is due to inadequate suboptimal MRIs rather than lesion not being there. And there is a recent uh, uh, yeah, resurgence of interest in 70 MRI. What we have currently in India, most centers are 3T MRI. Uh, so 70 MRI is uh, uh, found to be better in this recent uh, meta-analysis, but we don't have 70 MRIs in India as of now. Maybe in the near future, we would have. So this is a FDG PET, fluorodeoxyglucose PET. What you are seeing here is PET scan showing a highly A metabolic region here. And uh, this is your putamen, caudate putamen, and this is the region where you will have insula. If you compare the other side, you can see the metabolic activity there, but here A metabolic, completely there is no metabolism. And this is just a PET scan, and this is PET MRI overlay, PET MRI co-registration. You can find the insula, you can see in the MRI, but there is no metabolic activity. So this is left insula hypometabolism shown in the FTG PET scan. And this is a SPECT scan system. Again, interictal and ictal, you subtract and then you overlay with the MRI. So this is interictal SPECT, this is ictal SPECT. So the difference you can already make out, there is a hotspot there and then you can find the uh, MRI overlay there. So all these different modalities, MRI, PET, SPECT and MEG clusters, we integrate. This is called multimodality integration so that we know exactly where is where, what. So this patient basically has bilateral polymicrogyria. So this is a published case from this uh, journal. So uh, bilateral polymicrogyria and they are trying to work out which polymicrogyria, which site, which lesion or which site exactly is the reason for the epilepsy. So they are trying to integrate all these different information. And finally, they are saying most likely this is this right-sided lesion that is responsible for epilepsy. So not only important to have 
multiple different investigations separately, you need to put all these on top of each other, both in your mind as well as technologically in the space. This is another uh, example of multimodality integration. And uh, this PET showing hypometabolism here, and this is PET showing uh, hyper, hyper hotspot signal, hyper dynamicity, hyper uh, uh, flow there with the SPECT. And that has guided the stereo EEG implantation, which is very near the Broca's uh, cortex again, left frontal Broca's. So all these multimodality integration sometimes can lead on to direct surgery or sometimes help in better implantation of the electrodes. So at the end of all this, we come to a decision process, what we do. So epilepsy case conference is a very important process we do where multimodality, all the specialists, uh, epileptologists, neurologists, uh, epilepsy surgeon, anesthetists, neuropsychologists, radiologists, PETs and SPECT specialists, all these sit together and we discuss a case uh, threadbare and come to a decision-making process. So at the end of this, maybe the patient can be completely a straightforward case for surgery. So this is uh, happens in most of the times and uh, the decision is early, easy as well as the early decision can be made and the patient can go directly to surgery. But in difficult cases, the decision can be a bit uh, tricky and delayed and very difficult cases, more often they undergo invasive EEG. So the drug resistant epilepsy patient, sometimes they undergo surgery after the phase one investigation alone or after phase, basically this is phase one, phase two, some uh, terminology can be phase 1A and phase 1B also. So what I call this as phase one and phase two, so they can undergo surgery after each phase. If it is not conclusive, then they undergo invasive. Invasive can be stereo EEG or subdural electrodes. I'll show you briefly what are these. So basically this is a subdural electrode. You open the uh, brain and put a big grid like this. And this is subdural and this is open craniotomy. You open the brain and then close and uh, then do video uh, EEG monitoring for next three, four, five days. And this is how it looks in a cartoon. So this is subdural on the brain surface. You keep electrodes and record video EEG to precisely localize the seizure focus. The same thing can be done with the stereo EEG also. So this is another stereo tactic. This is basically uh, shown for uh, hypothalamic uh, hematoma. So something similar, we have a micro uh, burr hole through which we put a wire electrode through the brain uh, substance and there is no craniotomy, there is no opening of the brain. So you put micro burr hole and wire electrode. So this is less invasive compared to the subdural electrodes. So with that, I will conclude here in view of time. So epilepsy treatment is tailor-made. Drug-resistant epilepsy is usually associated with increased morbidity, mortality, and poor quality of life. But epilepsy surgery can make all the difference in all these spheres, especially epilepsy surgery is successful. You have selected the patient carefully enough by the process I already discussed with you. If the patient undergoes a surgery and the resection is adequate, you have removed the lesion completely, the patient will be already cured so that uh, negates the morbidity, mortality, and uh, improves the quality of life. So seizure freedom post-surgery is the single most important determinant of good outcome. So we need to keep in mind, whenever you come across any patient with drug-resistant epilepsy, any patient with drug-resistant epilepsy, basically a patient who failed to medication, best you should refer these patients early to comprehensive epilepsy surgery programs so that they have an option to undergo pre-surgical workup, depending on the case uh, uh, merits, and they have the option to se select whether they are surgical candidates or not, because that can make a lot of difference to the patient outcome. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Vishal? Uh, thank you very much, sir. It was, it was wonderful, and we had a full house and and excellent sir. Uh, a couple of questions sir. i'll start with uh, uh some of the questions and uh, so first question which is which is uh, there in the chat box is uh, if in case there's a recurrence of seizures after surgery in tuberous sclerosis child and the cause is another tuber can that child be operated again 
Yeah, very good question. And this is a very practical, many times we do come across this situation. So basically what happens, there are many misconceptions around this uh, point also. So people think there are multiple tubers and uh, each one is independently can cause seizures, but practically how it happens. So the epileptogenic tubers start firing very early on in the infancy. So if you see the data for tuberous sclerosis, 80% of these patients have epilepsy. Among those 80%, 90% of those patients with tuberous sclerosis who have epilepsy start their epilepsy in the first two years of age. Right? So what we believe, the seizure types, many times three different tubers can simultaneously fire and have seizures from three different tubers. But all these happens very early on, first two years of life. Only thing you need to identify, the patient has only single seizure type or two or three different seizure types. This sounds very simple and straightforward, but in real life, it is not so simple because many patients with tuberous sclerosis have a very subtle seizures. They just stare for a few seconds. That's all the seizure that you have for uh, tuberous sclerosis. So saying whether it is all the same staring or this staring is different from that, that staring is very difficult, very difficult. So what we do, we have a detailed video EEG monitoring. Again, record whether the head goes to this side, eyes goes to this side, eyes goes to this. So we have to make this distinction whether the patient has single seizure type or multiple seizure types early on before surgery. Most of the times patients have two or three different seizure types. You have tackled one seizure type by removing one particular tuber, but the other tubers remain, the other seizure focus remain. So that becomes more dominant more dominant the moment the first seizure goes off because of the interaction, because of the network hypothesis. So we do go back and remove the other tuber. Sometimes this is a front, right frontal, you remove the tuber. And after six months, one year, you realize that there are seizure recurrences. And this time you do all the evaluation and see it is a left temporal tuber. So you go, go in and remove the left temporal tuber. So in Melbourne, when I worked, uh, tuberous sclerosis, that was the apex center for the whole of Australia. And they have a rich experience of uh, operating on these tuberous sclerosis patients. And I've come across patients that underwent a third surgery, uh, rarely fourth surgery for removal of tuber. Some, sometimes you can be skeptical. Oh, you do four surgeries to make the patient seizure free. It is not that simple. So you have three parallel simultaneously firing tubers in three anatomically different locations. So you have to make the patient completely seizure free. You have to remove all the three uh, focus. Sometimes it is possible by one craniotomy. You have a frontal tuber and temporal tuber. You can remove in the one craniotomy that we have done. But many times it may not be possible in one sitting. So you try to remove only that particular tuber or that particular epilepsy uh, causing disabling seizures. So you tackle only that at that point in time. Then you come back later to tackle the other tubers and. Uh, uh, many patients have become completely seizure-free after second surgery, after third surgery, depending on the case. So it is not failure. Basically, you tackle the first tuber, the second tuber remains, and you go go in and remove that ox. Uh, great. Uh, the next one is, uh, can you share your experiences with uh, posterior cortex epilepsy surgery, especially those with hypoglycemic injury and those who develop LGS during the course? Yeah, so basically in hypoglycemic injury, uh, it's very common, very prevalent, all of us know, uh, to the extent almost every week we come across one or two new patients with the bilateral occipital glyphs, very unfortunate. And another important point is this is completely preventable by uh, correcting your early uh, breastfeeding and early feeding practices, right? So in this population, there are some of them have a predominantly unilateral or unilateral lesions. So those are the ideal candidates for surgery. So they have a, 90% of the cryosis on one side, 10%, 5% on the other side, but this is less common. Most common is bilateral symmetrical gliosis. They are very poor candidates for surgery. We have done few cases of bilateral symmetrical uh, gliosis also after undergoing a hell lot of uh, 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 pre-surgical evaluation, including studio EEG in one or two patients. They do very well, but uh, they are not the ideal candidates for surgery. The ideal candidates, uh, even within this population of uh, hypoglycemic brain in cells are predominantly unilateral or only unilateral lesions and especially with uh, uh, contralateral uh, uh, vision being normal 
So they do very well compared to bilateral symmetrical lesions. Uh, the, the, there's one more question, uh, Dr. Lakshmi. Uh, what is your opinion about the role of focused ultrasound for epilepsy surgery? It's a very new uh, modality. It is coming up, upcoming. So as of now, we don't have it in uh, India, in any center. This is a very hot topic and it's being discussed and uh, the literature and the experience from uh, our overseas colleagues has been that uh, this is a very game changer in that sense. Uh, but we need to see uh, how it goes and we need to uh, uh, look at the uh, long-term evidence whether it can be adequate for uh, complete resection. But I'm sure like we do use ultrasound nowadays, but it's our conventional ultrasound we use for localization on the uh, brain surface. Once you open up the dura, we do do ultrasound that, uh, but uh, focused ultrasound is entirely different thing. And uh, as of now, we don't have experience of that in India. Okay, uh, the last one for the day. How how far do you go for determination of the dominant lobe? Because because in because in kids, let's say two years, three years old kids, it can be absolutely challenging to determine the dominant lobe. Yeah, that's a very good question. There are two three different ways of looking at that. Say basically below four years, um, the the neuroplasticity is so much. We do not bother about this language um, dominance that much. That is one way to look at. So don't be uh, put off by, I'm being a bit categorical here. But above six years, you need to be very clear about what is the uh, uh, dominant lobe, what is the dominant uh, lateralization before we go on and operate. But below two years, below four years, if you are doing left uh, frontal or left temporal surgery, let us say, in below two or below four years age, if you are completely uh, disconnecting the language network, it is found in the neuroplasticity, still the other side can completely take over and he can become normal language wise. Having said that, there are many different shades of gray in between. Many patients with a lesion in the left frontal or left temporal, they are co-dominant. But unfortunately, below four years or below five years, we can't do fMRI. We don't do WADA or uh, any of that kind of stuff in these young patients. So it is a bit tricky. It is by your uh, philosophy. It is by your past experiences, by literature. We try to work out these. And as I told you, if you are disconnecting the language network completely on that side, left side, and if the lesion is so widespread, you know that uh, language can't be here. Say, for example, there is extensive left to frontal dysplasia or extensive left to frontal um, uh, gliosis and the patient is two or three year old having a normal speech development, normal language, you know, the language is on the right side, not on the left side, you can still operate on the left side. On the other hand, if the same patient has a speech delay and language delay, it may be co-dominant or the language is still on that side of the lesion. So you have to be a little bit careful. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ma'am, we lost you in between. Yeah, yeah, I totally got lost. My connection got lost. But uh, Lakshmi Narayan, I think it was a very lucid presentation. Very nice. We have understood everything. When we should do epilepsy surgery, what are the steps involved? But in all, it is a teamwork. Unless you have a good team, you cannot do it. And you require everybody in that team uh, maybe the semiology can be done by the neurologist, the video EEG, you should require a good MRI and you should help the MRI person by telling him that this is the area we are looking at, you know, by the semiology and the video EEG, we can make a hypothesis that it is in this zone and therefore it can be more interesting for the uh, neuroradiologists to identify the dysplasia or whatever the focal lesion is. And then yes, you can work on it. So yes, I think it was an excellent presentation and uh, it, it was not just a primer. It was an advanced primer. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I just want to highlight a very brief point. Uh, as you rightly put it, it's a teamwork. Uh, one request for the pediatric neurologist in this forum, in this platform is if you are referring the patient to a higher center, if you're referring the patient to comprehensive epilepsy center, please do not do PET scan or SPECT scan or MEG before sending because 
these sound very uh, simple and straightforward they are not in real life so if you are referring the patient better you refer the patient and uh, discuss with the uh, team member there rather than getting all these tests done and sending that uh, will put a lot of uh, problems for us as well as the patient sometimes patient has a, a mistress why you are doing the test again in the world anywhere you go the test many times have to be repeated in the same center because of the experience for them in that particular test is highly different compared to any center getting a pet now pet is become very easily available accessible in any part of uh, the india but uh, the uh, cancer pet is different epilepsy pet is different slightly so the pet scan and all that better it is done in the comprehensive epilepsy center itself so that they can integrate the data as well as they can do a better job of that so that is my humble request to all the referral uh, uh, neurologists and other physicians please do not get these tests uh, please refer the patient and discuss and finally you can have the all the answers and discussion and you can be part of the evaluation process but uh, you need to work with the team thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Lakshmi, and thank you very much, uh, Raji Daksha, ma'am, for an yeah. excellent, excellent session. With this, we come to the close of this session. Thank, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Vishal. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi.